everyone, welcome to this new photo room engineering video. Today I'm with Jan and we're going to talk about an exciting topic, which is how we can use the Pantene version and the Swift Package Manager to improve build times in very large iOS applications. So today we're going to be talking about the Pantene version and the Swift Package Manager. But first, maybe Jan, can you tell us a bit about what you do at Photorum? So I'm an iOS engineer with a focus on foundation and tooling topics. So I think many iOS developers nowadays are familiar with the Pantene injection and the concept of using a protocol to abstract a type. However, the Pantene version is about more than that. So for dependency inversion, let's take a step back and think about it in the context of modules. There's a distinction to make between compile time and runtime dependencies. So runtime dependencies these exist whenever code from a module A is calling code in the module B, which is different from a compile time dependency uh, that exists when code from a module A refers to code from a module B. In statically compiled languages, this dependency comes at a cost because the compiler actually needs to figure out which code it needs to compile in a different module. So whenever we're changing code in say module B and module A depends on module B, the compiler will actually need to go in and recompile both module A and module B before it's able to run the code. And so when you're working with a large project, these kind of things are going to have a big impact on your build time because if you change something in a small module but that the rest of your application depends on, then you basically have to rebuild everything, even though you maybe only change one little line in the implementation of a small module. Yes, exactly. And so I guess this is where the Pantene version is going to come into play to help us uh, improve on this situation, right? So if we visualize the situation, we can think of a module A and a module B that currently both have a compile and runtime dependency on each other. If we now actually introduce a protocol into the mix, this changes the picture. Module A and module B both have a compile time dependency on the protocol, but the runtime dependency dependencies is different. So both A and B have a compile time dependency on the protocol, but the runtime dependency opposes the flow of the compile time dependency. And this is where the term dependency inversion actually comes from. And this actually comes with another benefit because these modules can now be compiled independently each other so that the CPUs in your MacBook can actually compile all of these modules at the same time and thus also help speed up builds. Okay, I think I understand the theory of it. And so now we're going to try and put it in practice using SPM in Xcode. We'll create a sample project and walk us through all of these steps independently and show how this works in practice. So we go to the file menu, select package. Let's call this module A to keep it in terms before, from before we created. And we want to make sure that we add this directly to the project that we're currently working on. What we did now is uh, add a, a protocol module into module B. And in the target definition, we also have set up the dependency between module B and the module B protocol. We are splitting module B into two parts and then the rest with the actual code that implements module B. Exactly. So let's see what this currently looks like. We have uh, the module B protocol, which like any protocol just defines what this function will look like. And we have the implementation module B. So here we actually see that we import module B protocol into the implementation. We added an extension to module B that implements our module B protocol. And now we can do the same with module A. In the package description for module A, we added a package dependency on module B, and we added the product dependency of module A to the module B protocol. If we take a look at the source files, here we set up a, a view that will uh, display this random number. And again, like we saw with module B before, we import the module B protocol. So again, the view itself doesn't actually know about the, impl the implementation. It no only knows about the protocol. And another nice thing that we can do is actually create a mock for our Swift UI previews. So as we see here at the bottom, we created a mock number generator that complies to the same protocol and only returns a constant number so that if we have our Swift UI previews, and so here we see what this looks like in Swift UI preview, we have a text view and a button that will get us the random number. If we tap on that, it'll return the 42 that we defined in our mock implementation for the Swift UI preview. And now for the last part where it gets interesting, if we take a look at the project definition here, we import both module A and module B into our application target. And inside of the application uh, targets main view, we import both module uh, A and module B. And this is actually the first time now that we use the real implementation uh, module B 
that gets injected into our random number generator. And if we now try out the real implementation, so now we're displaying the random number view from module A inside of our content view, we can now use module B and get different random numbers. And so right now, if we were to go into module B and change the code that generates the random number, Xcode would need to rebuild module B. It would need to rebuild the app targets, but it wouldn't need to rebuild module A. Exactly. So that's the beauty of it. And the same goes that if we're iterating on just a single module. So if we set our compile unit to just module A, changes done in module B have no impact on the compile time. That's something we've been using actually quite a lot in the Photo app because we try to make all of our features in independent Swift packages. And so when we are working only on one feature, we can switch to the scheme of that feature. And for instance, uh, we can see that Swift UI previews are being generated much faster when we do that. Exactly. Okay, thanks a lot, Jan, for this explanation. I see that the pan scene version sounds super complex when you hear the name, but when you get down to it, it's just about taking a unit of code, splitting it into the public part and the private part and uh, reaping the benefits, basically. Exactly. And it's something that we've actually successfully used in this photo room app where we split our application into separate feature modules that don't depend on each other, which has greatly helped improve iteration speed while working on the, on the code. So that's all for this video. Once again, thank you Ian for the explanation. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the video. If you want to experiment with the code Ian showed, you have a link to download it in the description. And if you want to learn more about Photoroom as a company, you also have a link in the description to our website. Thanks for watching and see you next time.